I was 28, I received some very bad news. An unexplained symptom led to an endoscopy, led to a scan, led to a discovery of a rapidly growing lump in my chest. Malignant, just above my heart, growing into my trachea, pressing on my esophagus. Very bad news. This was the kind of news that left me with no business as usual. There was no incremental, gradualist option. There was only two radical paths. Radical treatment, burning my chest with a lifetime's dose of radiation and poisoning my body with powerful chemicals designed to kill many of my cells. Or there was the radical, basically inevitable and imminent consequence of not receiving any treatment. And our planet has received some very bad news. I doubt I need to rehearse the litany of stomach churning symptoms at this point in our history. The forests are being cut down, wetlands filled in, rivers dammed, aquifers sucked dry at an accelerating rate. Oceans are being stripped of fish and filled with plastic. Soils are being eroded, degraded, denuded of their healthy microbiota. Deserts are growing. Marine hypoxic dead zones extend further and further every year from the mouths of major rivers. Our very bodies are contaminated with dangerous, as dangerous and often novel substances. PFCs, pesticides, flame retardants, dioxins, microplastics, mercury, lead and more. Air pollution kills millions every year, compromises the respiratory health of billions of us. And, just revealed in the last week or two, is also making us all dumber by suppressing our cognitive abilities. Pollinators are vanishing, apex predators are being hunted to ecological irrelevance, and alien invasive species proliferate. Reefs are bleaching, humidity is rising, storms are intensifying, glaciers are melting, Permaf permafrost is thawing, temperatures are sweltering, seas are rising, species disappearing, ecosystems falling apart. For those of us who live on Earth, who breathe Earth air, drink Earth water, eat Earth food, rely on Earth's systems. This is very bad news. Our living planet is being devoured by a great machine. Our common home is becoming progressively less hospitable to life as we currently know it. Now, when confronted with such a severe diagnosis, we may want to get a second opinion. Is this really reliable information? Well, let's take climate change, perhaps the most high profile item on the litany of symptoms. To get a handle on the scientific understanding of the topic, we need to ask four basic questions. Is it happening? Is it us? Is it bad? And can we do anything? And the answer to each is yes. Is it happening? Yes. Multiple independent lines of evidence across scores of data sets point to the Earth system rapidly gaining heat energy. Whether we look at atmospheric temperature records, ocean temperature records, declining Arctic sea ice, declining glacier mass, declining ice sheet mass, rising sea levels, declining snow cover, increased permafrost thaw, the poleward and upward movement of species, and the timing of seasonal events, all of these point to this same conclusion. The planet is gaining heat more rapidly now than at any time in the history of human civilization and we are rapidly leaving the relatively stable climate of the last 10,000 years during which agriculture and cities and civilization developed. Second, is it us? Yes. Multiple telltale fingerprints in the observed changes point to human emissions of greenhouse gases as the primary culprit. Numerous studies that have attempted to quantify the human contribution have found that we are responsible for approximately 100% of the recently observed warming. This is the explicit or implicit position of more than 97% of peer-reviewed papers over the last 20 years, and more than 97% of the top experts, and of more than 190 scientific bodies of national or international standing to have considered all the evidence, and there are none that disagree. Consensus doesn't make good science, but good science makes consensus where there is a consensus of data. No other account can explain all this data. 
if 97% of oncologists said that you had late stage cancer requiring urgent treatment, would you refuse to act? So third, is it bad? Yes. Climate impacts are already harming people and ecosystems in myriad ways. I listed some of them above. Worse heat waves, droughts, storms, rising oceans, declining crop yields, ecosystems stressed beyond their ability to cope. Think the Great Barrier Reef and coral bleaching. Human societies stressed beyond their ability to cope. Think of the devastation on Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria or the Arctic communities that are needing to relocate as their coastal infrastructure falls into the sea or the nomadic herders in Tibet who've had to abandon their traditional lifestyle due to the effects of rising temperatures on their herd's food supply. We've only seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to impacts. They're already bad, and the further and the faster we warm, the worse they get. Plenty of people I know have been unable to sleep after reading about the impacts of what is likely on our current trajectory. And some of those most disturbed are the scientists conducting the research. So yes, it's bad. But can we do anything? Our fourth question, yes. The less carbon dioxide we collectively emit, the slower and smaller the changes will be. Even with ambitious, aggressive action, we still face unprecedented challenges and irretrievable losses. But without such action, we could well face the end of industrial global civilization in anything like its present form, along with the loss of a majority of uh, currently existing species and ecosystems. The actions that we collectively take today will shape the relative habitability of the planet for complex life for millennia to come. So is it happening? Yes. Is it us? Yes. Is it bad? Yes. Can we do anything? Yes. Now all of us find this diagnosis hard to swallow. It isn't simply that it's distressing, though it is, or that it might make us furious or ashamed or horrified or powerless or filled with a sense of doom, though it can be all these things. Awakening to the reality of climate change and ecological degradation can unsettle our sense of self, can undermine some of the basic stories we use to orient and guide our lives. This is deeply threatening to most people. And so we use the various coping mechanisms, uh, all kinds of coping mechanisms to prevent this serious diagnosis from disturbing our identity and habits, enabling us to maintain a sense of coherence and meaning and agency in the face of realities that threaten to overwhelm all three. Faced with the loss, not just of ecosystems or coastal infrastructure, but perhaps even more profoundly, confronted with the potential loss of coherence, meaning, agency, we naturally engage all kinds of emotional defense mechanisms that deflect the full impact of our situation. Whether it's engaging in forms of denial, where we just choose to look away from what is staring us in the face, or we deflect by focusing attention on others, shifting the blame, whether we disengage, where we, we put up a mask of apathy to cover over the, uh, the unresolved grief, whether we find distractions to focus our attention on other good things in life, <clears throat> or whether we engage in forms of delusional thinking, wishful thinking, magical thinking that imagines some silver bullet technology that's going to save us, or some god going to swoop down and pluck us from our plight. Or whether we engage in a sense of desperation, desperately grabbing onto whatever solutions might be offered, however improbable. Or whether we walk into despair and abandon all attempt to do anything. These common patterns are all there to defend our sense of self, defend the coherence and the meaning and the agency that we wish to have in the world. And they're some of the reasons why so many of us do so little about such a serious issue. So instead, we need to walk into these deeply uncomfortable realities, to face them and to live in their awful truths, 
to allow ourselves to feel pain for our world and for ourselves. This takes moral courage. Here's what noted eco-psychologists Joanna Macy and Chris Johnston have to say. Pain for the world, a phrase that covers a range of feelings, including outrage, alarm, grief, guilt, dread and despair, is a normal, healthy response to a world in trauma. Did you catch that? A normal, healthy response to a world in trauma. Awakening to our climate predicament and our ecological catastrophe provokes a range of uncomfortable emotions, fear, anger, Grief, guilt, horror, confusion, these are, these are right and proper and ought not to be suppressed or avoided. But it's at this point that it makes a real difference to follow Jesus. Because for those of us who are Christian, who place our trust in Jesus and seek to walk in his path, our story, our meaning, our coherence, our agency is grounded in the unwavering, unearned, unshakable yes that God says to each of us in Christ. This doesn't make the pain go away. Far from it. Faith, faith at this point isn't a shield against the discomfort of learning that the world is hurting, that life as we know it on earth is dying. No, if anything, faith worsens that discomfort by affirming that it doesn't have to be this way, that another world is possible. By speaking of liberation, faith makes us only more aware of the chains that still bind. The scriptural tradition of lament is too often neglected in our personal and common worship, but I think it's really important at this point. Biblical scholar Kathleen O'Connor writes, lament names what is wrong, what's out of order in God's world, what keeps human beings from thriving in all their creative potential. Simple acts of lament expose these conditions, name them, open them to grief and anger, and make them visible for remedy. In its complaint, anger and grief, lament protests conditions that prevent human thriving, and this resistance may finally prepare the way for healing. Similarly, Pope Francis writes, our goal in, in, in naming the, the brokenness of the world and the, the ecological crises that we face, our goal is not to amass information or satisfy curiosity, but rather to become painfully aware, to dare to turn what's happening to the world into our own personal suffering and thus to discover what each of us can do about it. We live in the shadow of a planet-devouring machine. Honest grief is not something to fear. Indeed, according to the Apostle Paul, godly sorrow brings repentance and a, an eager desire to change and to seek justice. We need some of that godly sorrow, that honest grief, that lament. And this is where we need to finish with hope. But Hope is a dangerous delusion much of the time. If hope makes us passively acquiescent to injustice, we can, particularly if that's injustice we might be causing, then hope is a dangerous delusion. If hope makes us think we're to sit back and just let God fix it, then we haven't heard the commission of the risen Christ directing us to fear not and to go into the world with good news. Good, good news in our words, but embodied also in our lives. If hope leads us to assume that clever people will sort it out for us, that some silver bullet techno fix will deliver us clean, cheap energy forever, or some technocrat will implement a rational policy to tidy this all up, or that some entrepreneur will blast us off to an escape on Mars, such hope is dangerous delusion. If we hope that the machine can be argued into being nicer. If we hope that the, the planet devouring machine can be persuaded politely but firmly to stop gobbling up quite so much of our planet, then we are dangerously deluded. These are false hopes. Instead, let me finish with a longish quote 
from Vaclav Havel, the Czech playwright, political dissident and prisoner, and then president. Though he was not a Christian, his reflection here is, I believe, deeply shaped by the nature of Christian hope. He writes, hope is not essentially dependent on some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not prognostication, prediction. It is an orientation of the spirit, an orientation of the heart. It transcends the world that is immediately experienced and it's anchored somewhere beyond its horizons. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy that things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously heading for success, but rather an ability to work for something that is good, not just because it stands a chance to succeed. The more unpropitious the situation in which we demonstrate hope, the deeper the hope is. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. In short, I think that the deepest and most important form of hope, the only one that can keep us above water and urge us to good works, and the only true source of the breathtaking dimension of the human spirit and its efforts is something we get, as it were, from elsewhere. It's also this hope, above all, which gives us the strength to live and continually to try new things, even in conditions that seem hopeless, as ours do here and now. Hubble's point is that hope doesn't mean an optimism that will all turn out okay in the end, or even a hunch that with enough determination, ingenuity and cooperation, we can make it turn out okay. Instead, hope is the conviction that whatever happens, each compassionate action, each honest word, each creative act of resistance, each costly attempt to protect our common home, each opportunity to pour sand into the gears of that planet-gobbling machine is worth it.